Thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? Well, I live in Abergavy at the moment. But I've what? Been... <laughs> <laughs> but I've lived in the Oxford area most of my life. And I went up to Oxford from the from Little Grammar School in North Wales. So uh, School. And then, uh, and then from Oxford, I, well, I spent a long time in Oxford getting involved in the space business, actually, making instruments for spacecraft. Excellent. Because um, a big day in my life was when the first Sputnik went up, and I looked at this thing in the sky. And here was me trying to make measurements in the atmosphere, and get to understand the atmosphere and how the atmosphere behaves. And making measurements from aircraft, you're making measurements from the ground and anywhere <coughs> other than where I could, but only in very restricted areas, of course. Mm -hmm. It was an object that was up there that was going around the world, but view of everything twice per day. Mm -hmm. And if only we could stick an instrument on that, make measurements of the atmosphere, we'd be in business. Exactly. So that was the, the first part of my life it was very exciting indeed. I then left Oxford, I became head of the Met Office a bit later on and uh, got involved in the Met Office and uh, happened to be there on the 16th of October 1987 when the, there was a big storm. Most of you won't remember that. But I've heard stories. <laughs> I've heard stories. My parents live in South But it was 15 million trees blown down in southern England. And uh, we didn't do a particularly good forecast. And it was all my fault, therefore, the whole storm. And I was chased over, uh, chased over the weekend rather nastily. But then the following Monday, and that was a Friday when the storm hit, the following Monday it turned out to be Black Monday. The stock market crashed. And I was, they weren't interested in me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they went to go and tackle other people. So that was a, an interesting day in my life. And then uh, after I spent the Met Office, one of the big, biggest things I, I did when I left, or almost left the Met Office, was become chair of the scientific working group of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <coughs> and that was a fascinating task, trying to understand climate change. Getting, getting together the world scientists. We got thousands of us together actually, one form or another, to try to tackle the problem and see how the Earth was really behaving and what we had to do about it. And I'll tell you a bit about that later on tonight. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and over to you for the talk. Okay. Thank you. Well, you might think my topics are actually a bit ambitious to talk about God, science and global warming, all in one, on one occasion, or even in one breath. But there's a lot to be said for putting things together, for putting big things together, trying to look for big pictures. So it would be, I hope, a bit of a big picture talk as I talk about God and science and then the very modern problem of global warming. Let's begin with a quick look at the universe. We start with our galaxy. I'm telling you lots of it, things you know, of course, but the galaxy is the, uh, the Milky Way in the night sky. It's a wonderful thing to look at if you can find a dark enough night somewhere to, to see it. I don't know if any of you know how many stars you find in the Milky Way in our galaxy. Any guesses as to how many stars are there? You can tell, you can tell me in millions if you like. 100 million. 100 million? Uh, not quite there yet. 100 billion. 100 billion. That's right. That's more or less it. Very good. A lot of stars. Our sun is a very modest member of that sort of the galaxy. And, um, and the... Um, uh, And though, as I said, a billion or a hundred billion, a hundred billion stars there, and it's a million, million, million kilometres across, so let's get my notes in some order. Now there are some galaxies which are a long way away, lots of galaxies in the universe. How many galaxies do we have in the universe? Do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
stars of million galaxies. Uh, th stop it. Stars of billions. Um, I get these numbers mixed up. We have um, about the same number, actually, about a, about a billion galaxies in the universe. And um, let me move, move this home. There we are. Here is a picture taken by NASA from one of its uh, uh, one of the, uh, the spacecrafts. It's sent to look at the universe. This is getting close to the edge of it, not very close to the edge of the universe, it's two billion light years away. And must very interesting objects up there. Galaxies, stars, um, of all kinds. And light takes two billion light years to it took a billion years to get to us from those galaxies. And if you look at the smudges, which are put at, the, at the end of the arrow, they're also galaxies smudged out. Why are they smudged out? Because light comes from these galaxies which are behind, about as far behind as, uh, as, as the, these galaxies are in front. And, um, and they get smudged out. Why do they get smudged out? Because of a gravitational attraction of the galaxies you can see in, the, in, in that picture. So how did the universe begin? We all, there's, there's a lot of evidence that it began with the Big Bang about 14 billion years ago. The universe expanded from an extremely small, an extremely, an extremely small <coughs> Uh, ball or whatever it was, it wasn't a ball, it was a, it was a point, extremely, but extremely dense and, um, and a very hot beginning. And it gradually expanded quite fast to begin with. And protons and neutrons and electrons were formed and atoms also, eventually, of hydrogen and helium. And as the universe, the universe expanded, Gravity helped the stars to form. And how many stars do we have in the universe? There are, well it was, uh, it's 10 to the 23 or thereabouts. A couple of years ago it was thought to be 10 to the 22. It's gone up by a factor of 10 <coughs> over the last 10 years, the last few years. So that's an awful lot of stars. And each of these stars is a stellar kitchen. These kitchens start with hydrogen and helium, and then as the stars contract and get hotter, more complex atoms formed. The elements we all know in the periodic table, lithium, beryllium, carbon, oxygen, all the way up the periodic table to iron. And then, from time to time, big stars explode in what are called supernovae. That's an event in the Crab Nebula, which was observed, actually first observed by Chinese astronomers on the 4th of July, 1054. And within these explosions, heavier elements are formed, lead, gold, all the way to uranium. And after these explosions, the matter that's there, and you can see this object with the naked eye, actually, if, you're, if you've got regular eyesight, and it's, um, it's still there, and it will, of course, be there for a very long time. But it's gradually turning again and condensing into new stars. And our sun is a second generation star, actually, with a very rich content of elements. And then we're here on Earth. And for human life to be possible, we need all those elements that have been made by these, <coughs> by these processes which have occurred within the universe. And in order for that to occur, the universe had to be extremely large, extremely big, extremely old, because it takes a long time, and incredibly fine-tuned. I won't tell you about the fine-tuning, because right at the beginning, it had to be the start of the Big Bang. 
have to be so fine-tuned to an incredible degree in order for the universe to be the sort of universe we have. So you might ask the question, was the universe made with humans in mind? That's an interesting question to ask. There may be, of course, other creatures all over the place in the universe, for we know, which um, might have been in mind too. But without the universe, there's no way that humans can have been formed in the way we know. So that's the story of the universe. And Albert Einstein, probably one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, used to say the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. So another question we're bound to ask also is, is there intelligence behind the universe? And a further question, where do the laws of nature come from? Where does our awe and wonder come from as we look at the whole story? Well, science doesn't make up the laws of nature. Science discovers the laws of, laws of nature. They're there to be discovered. So science can't be the only story. Science just is describing part of the very big story. Science can't be the only story, but there's more actually, because that's not all. Sometimes I said the most complex thing we have knowing the universe is here. Lots of them around this room. Our brains. What goes on in our brain? Our mind. We can think, we can feel. We have what we call personality. Where do all these things come from? What is mind? Have you ever seen a definition of mind that's satisfactory? There isn't one that I know of. I'd like to know of. You know one of one that's absolutely satisfactory. We have mind and personality. And if we have minds and personalities, if God is the creator of the universe, and if we have it, or if we believe there is a creator of the universe, does he have personality too? Does he have a mind? And there's obviously a possibility, maybe a likelihood, that the creator would, would just walk away from the universe, not be quite where he'd go, but um, he, he would, wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. He'd want to enjoy the universe he'd made. So, what I'm trying to suggest to you, that if <coughs> I or you might know the creator of the universe personally, that really would be very fantastic. One of the greatest things that we could ever attain to. And my answer to that is absolutely yes. The most fantastic, fantastic thing that could happen to me or to you is to come into some contact with the creator of the universe. Also ask the question, of course, where is God? If he's the creator, we think of him as creator outside the universe. But he also comes into the universe, perhaps, in some ways. Why should he keep out of it? He's very concerned with what he's made, as any creator would be. And as its creator and sustainer, he knows it through and through. Not just made the universe and gone away, he's taken a great interest in it. So if God is the creator, and the science we do is God's science. I've been a scientist all my life and tried to learn a great deal by putting science and God together because they belong together. A very exciting exploration and worth exploring, a very big story. 
way beyond our imagination in a way. We can only make small steps within that exploration, but it's something that's really very big and very wonderful. And part of that also, uh, no, a little thing about sound before I come on to that. Science produces a very big story covering and he's growing all the time. The scientific project, trying to understand it, the science of everything, has become extremely vast. But the remarkable thing about it is that the more we find out the more we realise that there is to find out. So it's not a converging process, it's an expanding process. The scientific story gets bigger and shows no sign at all of stopping its expansion. And that's worth turning over in your mind to realise that here is a, the story of science which is just growing and growing and growing and shows no sign at all. In fact, it's expanding all the time. And that's not surprising if you believe in God, because God has something very big out there. And God is way beyond our imagination too, way beyond anything we can imagine. And the more you, the little we find out about God, the little I find, tried to find out about him, leaves me with the realisation there's so little I understand, there's so little I know, and yet there's so much more to find out. A fantastic expanding scene. And we're really being put to look after that and to make sure that it's not ruined in any way. And so I come on to something that I've spent a lot of time in my life on the challenge of global warming. Something that's been known for 200 years starts with the greenhouse effect. Not all of the, the words on this or things because of this picture have come out, but it's uh, what is the greenhouse effect? Well, the sun shines radiation onto the Earth's surface coming through the atmosphere, the large is only impeded in the absence of clouds. Energy coming in is matched by energy going out in the infrared, the red lines emitted from the Earth's surface. A lot of that can't get to space because of the absor it's absorbed by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere on the way up. The main greenhouse gas is, is water vapour actually, and carbon dioxide, methane and lots of other gases play, play a small part. And these gases are acting as blankets over the Earth's surface, absorbing the radiation, re-emitting it upwards and downwards and making the Earth warmer than, it, warmer than it would otherwise be. In fact, if the, uh, these gases were not there, there wasn't a greenhouse effect, then um, the Earth's surface would be covered by ice, and it would be a very low temperature indeed. But because they're there, we have a quite a, a good temperature for humans, and all sorts of other creatures to live because we've adapted to it. It is meant to be a greenhouse over those hours of the light on the right hand side because a greenhouse, the glass in the greenhouse has somewhat the same uh, effect as the, as the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It absorbs the, absorbs the infrared radiation going out, it allows the sunlight to come in. That's how it works, or partly how, why the greenhouse keeps, keeps warm. And the main greenhouse gas that's of importance because uh, we have a, a water vapour is controlled by what happens in its, uh, in its evaporation and condensation and so on. Carbon dioxide is a gas that's, that has a long life in the atmosphere. 200 years ago it was 
about 270 parts per million, it's now 400 parts per million. And why? Because we're burning coal, we're burning oil, and we're burning <coughs> gas. And we're putting a lot of extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that it, uh, uh, that's why it's getting warmer, and that's where the global warming comes from. The blanket is getting thicker. There's uh, a lot of CO2 and all things stuff going into the atmosphere from a power station. It did, that one's actually just closed down because it's, it was too old to satisfy all sorts of regulations, European regulations. They're going to possibly rebuild it, and I hope they will put in carbon capture and storage when they do that. So how is the Earth warming, and how much is it warming? That's the mean temperature change from the 1950s to 2000, to the first uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, the land has risen in temperature by the order of one degree, many places. The sea, of course, is uh, only warmed <coughs> by less than half a degree on the whole over this period. So the average is still well uh, under one degree. You think, well, what on earth is that? It's too small to be bothered about. But it isn't actually, because this is over the whole world. And the difference between the middle of an ice age and the warm periods in between ice ages, in terms of global average temperature, is only five or six degrees. So if we are going to if we get one or two degrees going, it's, that's a good fraction of an ice age. So it's a, and it's happening very fast. It's happened, this has happened in about 20 or 30 years. So that's uh, happening far too fast for many creatures to adapt to and for humans to adapt to as well. As you will notice from the last slide, the, the, the warmest part of the Earth, Earth, the part that's warmed most, is the Arctic. The white on this the picture is the sea ice on the 21st of September 2012, which is the, about the, uh, the smallest area of sea ice, or the time of the smallest area of sea ice during the annual cycle. The pink line is the uh, average uh, September temperature, September coverage of sea ice um, during the period from 1980 to 2000. And you'll see half of the ice is gone. Half of the sea ice has gone over that period. Faster than any of us would have predicted. Because the, uh, the Arctic is warming more warm, more than more, uh, any of the rest of the Earth. And that's happening because of global warming. Now let's move on a bit to predictions of what the temperature will be later in the century. That's the projected changes by the 2050s. And I won't tell you these calculations are made by uh, computer models of the climate, which are tested against the um, way in which the actual climate has been altering over the last 30, 40 years, and so we have some confidence in these extrapolations. The, uh, the warmest uh, temperatures then on land will be 5, 4, 4, between 3 and 5 degrees C, and that's a big lot. The uh, oceans will be almost, uh, be, uh, be the, almost a degree warmer, and that's, uh, that's a big, lot, big change for the oceans. Um, in fact, so something that's been uh, people have concentrated on measuring over the last 10 years or so has been the temperature down in the oceans, down to two, two kilometres or so, 2,000 metres, uh, just to discover whether the ocean as a whole is, war is warming up. And it is. The temperature of the ocean as a whole is war warming up substantially, <coughs> but it takes an awful long time for the oceans to warm up. There's a hundred times more um, 
more of the capacity, thermal capacity in the oceans than there is in the atmosphere. So it's not surprising it hasn't warmed up very much yet. <coughs> and it will now and it will carry on warming for a long, long period into the future. Because the whole thing is out of, the oceans are out of equilibrium now with the with, with the balance at the surface. So even if we turned off all the emissions of carbon dioxide tomorrow, we stopped global warming happening from tomorrow, the oceans would warm for the next century and catch up with the temperature of the atmosphere. And that would have a very big effect on the oceans and on, on the climate and so on. So we're doing something that can't be reversed at all easily. And people who say, well, let's wait and see what happens and when it gets bad enough, we'll have to do something. But that's no good because we haven't, it's happening very slowly to begin with. And we've already built into the system the, um, the very big changes indeed. I'll say a bit more about those in a minute. I'll just talk about three impacts of climate change, three of the main impacts. First of all, sea level rise. We're talking of the best part of a metre before the end of this century in average sea level rise around the world because of what we've done already or, and are continuing to do um, even if we've reversed it quite a lot or, or slowed it down quite a lot we still get the best part of the meter. It's uh, a banger will notice it of course because uh, the Manor States will notice it. But a banger death. There's the one, two, three and five meter contours. There are 10 million people living within the one metre contour. And where do those people go? The Indians are building a fence around the frontier to keep them out. <coughs> and that's, that's only a small part of the problem because you have 25 million people in southern China, you have lots of islands which are no more than about two metres above sea level in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And um, they're going to, a lot of those will disappear as places where people can live. Where are they going to go? And so on around the world. And uh, a lot of the world's population lives very close to the sea. And they're going to have many cities in the world. We'll have to spend billions in trying to cope with the problem. There's a Bangladeshi family is escaping from a flood they've had and trying to go somewhere and where are they going to go? Heat waves. In 2003 there was a massive heat wave in, in, in Europe, um, quite unprecedented in the, in the record of the weather and climate in Europe. And um, the, the June, July and August temperature went up beyond 40 Celsius for days on end in quite a lot of European cities. And it's estimated with you know, reasonable confidence that something like 30,000 people died prematurely because of that heat wave. And there have been lots of heat waves since and we've, we're, we're seeing more of these of course in, in many parts of the world which haven't seen some, some of which haven't seen them before. Places like Russia had a very big one a couple of years ago, and so on. And then we have the hydrological cycle, and what changes will, be, will there be there? Well, as the Earth gets warmer, we'll get more evaporation of water from the oceans, we'll get more water vapor in the atmosphere, that means more rainfall on average. And we're seeing that, we're measuring that at the moment. But as also as water vapour enters the atmosphere, it condenses to form clouds, water drops. And in that condensation process, latent heat is released. And that latent heat is the biggest single source of energy for the atmosphere's circulation. So you have more energy coming into the, into the whole hydrological cycle, that will be called more intense, and the result of that will be um, 
will be more intense rainstorms, rainfall events, and also more floods. And incidentally, also, I mean, I looked at how that argument goes, also more droughts. It's just more energy in that system. <coughs> now, floods and droughts are the most damaging of the disasters we know on Earth. They cause more deaths, more misery, more economic loss than any other disaster. So more of them is bad news for everybody, and particularly those who live in vulnerable areas. And estimates are that uh, the risk of some of those things may increase by a factor of five by mid-century, which is bad news. Last week, there was a big event in the Philippines. There was the typhoon Haiyan, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, Haiyan or something like that. You have read all about it. Now the projections for the future are that we won't get more hurricanes or typhoons, tropical storms. Um, not likely to, there's no evidence to increase in number, but the most intense ones will tend to become more intense. So there'll be more high ends to come. And it doesn't take much, ima much imagination to see if you've got more of those, and they became more, even more intense than that one. It has hit the Philippines. That will bring disaster, big disasters to, or tend to bring this disasters to parts of the world. It's a, I hardly know them at the moment. And drought is also a terrible thing. It lasts a long time, of course, and you don't hear so much about it. But droughts are, there have been longer droughts in the during recent years than we've had usually before. And that's in particular places like Africa where it's they're, they're that, how to cope with it is a big problem. So there we have a summary of some of the impacts this century. Um, I've talked about most of those things, so I'll just move on from that. But it's not a, it's a rather frightening story. So what can we do about it? In 1992, there was the Earth Summit in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, which was looking at these problems, looking at problems of the environment, and a World Climate Convention was set up involving all nations, and in general view, emissions by developed nations should had to go down and not up to allow some room for developing nations to grow in their use of, uh, of greenhouse gas, in their, uh, of, of fossil fuels, in order for their economies to grow. In fact, if the developed world has not reduced its emissions very much, um, nothing like as much as it should have done, and the developing the world has been, like China and India, have been uh, growing there is very substantially. So what action do we take do we need to take? Well there's a list of things that we can easily do in our developed world. We can increase our energy efficiency in buildings, we can increase the the amount of insulation we have in them. Uh, do you live in a home that's well insulated? If you don't, get on with doing something about it. Um, we can become much more energy efficient in our use of devices. We can use things like ground source heat pumps, which, uh, which produce a factor of four in terms of the heat, heat that comes out of them per unit of energy than you find for an electric fire, for instance. We can become more efficient in our use of electricity, or in our uh, try to become, and so on. We can, we've got to become much less carbon intensive in agriculture. Agriculture can either emit carbon 
carbon uh, uh, sources, or it can um, absorb them. And uh, whether they're emitters or, or, or absorbers, it's not at all obvious from the sort of agriculture you're doing. So farmers really <coughs> have, to, have to do study a great deal actually in order to make sure agriculture is not a net source of greenhouse gases. And we should move as fast as we can to electric vehicles, the electricity not coming from fossil fuel sources. And we've also got the whole deforestation around the world, which is causing something like 20% 20, 20 of the emissions problem. And just very quickly, there's a big solar array somewhere in America. The solar energy is one possible source. We can, we can do small solar arrays in villages in the developing world, and that will help with a great deal. Um, even if they don't have any other energy source, um, there are other ways of there's tidal sources of energy, which I'm very keen on. Whales can produce a lot of tidal sources quite easily, uh, but because of tidal streams under, uh, uh, in the ocean, Anglesey has a lot of um, tidal turbines working at the moment. Or, and there's a proposal, which, because we happen to live in North Wales, a proposal for uh, lagoons being built along the coastline um, with uh, turbines within the walls of the lagoons. It's quite shallow water going out a long way from the coast in North Wales. And this would, uh, we could get a lot of energy that way. The seven barrage, or seven barrage, or something like it in the south of Wales, could, could create a lot of energy too. And Wales could get all its electricity from uh, joining together sources in the north and sources in the south because they, they're trying to come in at different times and you fill the whole day in that way. So there are lots of things we can do, we just have to get on with it and do it. So, let me leave you with a few general thoughts. Climate change builds an enormous moral imperative to all of us. The Christian people in particular perhaps because we are concerned about the world and we should be concerned about everybody in the world in the way that that's what everybody is. But it's a moral imperative for everybody because in the rich world we've grown rich because we've had cheap coal and oil and gas. We didn't realise the damage we were causing, especially to poor countries. And so the Rich countries must reduce the damage by and developing uh, and, and assist poor countries to develop sustainably. That is, there's a very strong moral imperative there. Whatever your religion, whatever your views, you can't get it run away from the fact that we've grown, grown rich in certain ways, <coughs> which have. Uh, on the uh, because of uh, fossil fuel generation, fossil fuel use, and we should do something about it. Now, there are those who say, well, we first have to tackle world poverty, and then we can tackle climate change. The answer to that is no, because unless we tackle climate change, there'll be a lot more world poverty very fast, because climate change is affecting the poorer world more than it's affecting the rich world. Can the world afford this energy revolution? The IEA, no lesser body than the most, most um, the, the best body in the world for doing something about it or for telling us to do something about it. They're not green people. They happen to be good engineers and good scientists, good technologists and so on. They know how it can be done and they've said how it can be done. They were asked, in fact, by the G8 meeting in Edinburgh 
2006 it was asked the IEA tell us how we can how we can slow this whole thing down down and turn turn over the um, the growth of carbon emissions and um, the IEA has written about it ever since and shown that it really can be done and it can be done cheaply and it will be very good, good for other reasons too. <coughs> Hasn't the recession to have top priority? Then climate change? No, because we should be tackling the two together. And there's a lot of benefit from tackling the two together. So we have a crisis of sustainability. And what is this? <coughs> and what is this crisis? It's what do we mean by being sustainable? It means not cheating on our children. Not cheating on our neighbours, not cheating on the rest of creation, and indeed we're treating we're we're cheating in all those ways at the moment when we shouldn't be doing that. Some reasons for optimism. I've seen the commitment of the world scientific community to tackling these problems, and that, that's been very very more heartwarming indeed to see everybody committed to doing something about it. The necessary technology is available. I also believe, of course, because I <coughs> believe that God, God's interested in the whole thing too, that he's committed to his creation and he will help us. He will, wants to be our partner, actually, in caring for creation and doing his work in that way. I'll stop there. And leave you with a lovely picture of the earth taken from the moon. Except to say, perhaps I brought some books along tonight too, which are uh, on sale, I think, back there somewhere. And uh, there's, uh, the books consist of uh, two of mine, which is recently written with the, uh, the help of a wonderful ghostwriter, my autobiography, and so with a lot about of the work of the IPCC, which was a big battle in many ways, battling with um, those who don't want to change anything at all because of the fossil fuel lobby and the, uh, was a big problem, and also the uh, uh, some countries like Saudi Arabia and others, of course, who have a tremendous interest in oil. So there was big battles to be undertaken. And I've written that up, and if you're interested, there's my book there. There's another book, which is The Search for God Can Science Help, which I try to put some ideas from science and from faith together. And there's a further book on sustainability, um, which is uh, by many, a number of authors trying to really put over the Christian case for taking sustainability extremely seriously. So they're, they're four pounds each, uh, a very discounted rate, and please go and look at the bookstore afterwards. Thank you very much.